So welcome to the Pulse of Miami Church. And uh, if this is your first time here, let me take this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Todd Peterson, and I'm the lead pastor here at this church. Uh, Caleb, can you go ahead and just take down my mic just a hair? And if, uh, for those of you who are here today who are really excited and you're like, Todd, get this over with because the World Cup is coming on, uh, I will, I actually have a shortened sermon just for you. So just letting you know that, because uh, I love you. I love you. And uh, I don't have a whole lot of love for, you know, football, but, you know, I love you. So uh, we're going to do that. Uh, now today, we're going to continue our series called Letters to the Church, in which we're kind of sampling different letters that were written by the disciples to the church. And see, by looking at these and by kind of sampling each one of these, we're getting an idea of what overall Scripture is trying to say to us. It helps us to read Scripture better for ourselves. Now, the question that I want to struggle with today, this is what I want us to wrestle with, is this question, how are believers supposed to be different? How are believers supposed to be different? Now, I'm going to apply that to myself as a pastor, right, because... Um, you know, how are pastors supposed to be different? In fact, uh, next week we're going to talk about how to spot a good pastor and how to spot a bad pastor. And we're going to look at scripture to figure that out. And as I said in the first service, you guys may decide not to come to church with me after that and be like, well, he's a bad pastor, so we're not going there. But, um, you know, one of the things that I have uh, more often than not, there's, there's a lot of expectations of pastors. And different people have different expectations. And for some reason, I'm the kind of guy that um, I violate everybody's expectations. And so I get this a lot. You're a pastor? I don't know. After I said or did whatever I said or did, you know, that I get the, and the longer the pastor, the worse I guess it is that I offended them in, in one way or another. And so here's what, what I find. There's a lot of people with a lot of different expectations. But my question is, what exactly is God's ex- expectation of me? You know, what are believers, or how are believers, and how are pastors supposed to be different? You know, there's several of us in here that you've raised your hand and you said yes to Jesus as your Savior. And maybe you came in and on the day that you said yes to Jesus, your life was a mess. Maybe you were going through a crisis. Maybe you hated your job or you hated your boss or you were in some bad relationships. But here you are a few weeks, a few months, maybe even a few years later, and you're still in crisis. You still have that same crummy boss. You're still having the relationship problems, and it's like, wow. I thought when I said yes to Jesus, my life would change. Now, how are believers supposed to be different? Why isn't my life different? It feels like it didn't take. How are believers supposed to be different after they say yes to Jesus? And then there are those of us in here who we've had a lot of experience in Christian circles, in Christianity. And perhaps you've experienced this where there's a lot of different opinions about how believers are supposed to be different. There are some people that, you know, they believe that all Christians, once you say, say yes to Jesus, that you should never, ever use a curse word for the rest of your life. And if you ever do, then you're not really saved, Right? And there's other people that are like, listen, we are, once you get saved, you can only listen to Christian music, you know, and then they get in your car and they see that you're, you have like a non-Christian radio station on, they're like, oh, and I thought you were a Christian, you know. And there's all kinds of like rules that Christians put on each other, but here's what we want to do today. We want to open up scripture and let scripture speak for itself. So here's the challenge. If, if you've lived for a long time within Christian circles. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to put aside everything that everybody else has ever told you about how Christians are supposed to be different. I want to put aside all the opinions. I'm not going to give you my opinion today, and we're just going to open up Scripture and let Scripture speak for itself and answer the question, how are believers supposed to be different? But before we do, I just want to address one more thing kind of person. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you're just searching for God. The reason you're here is because you just want to, is God real? Is he not? 
And if I were to take this step, and if I were to say yes to Jesus, what would my life look like? What is Jesus's, do I have like all these rules that Jesus wants to apply to my life after that? How are believers supposed to be different? In order to answer this question, we're going to open up to 1 John chapter 4. Now, quick tip, uh, I've been talking a lot about you guys figuring out how to read scripture for yourselves. I've been giving you guys tips like blueletterbible.com that allows you to translate the original Greek or the original Hebrew so that you can kind of get an idea of what it's saying. Instead of seeing a translation, you can see it for yourself. Well, quick tip, um, uh, Carmen this last week told me, she said there's this, this great thing on YouTube called the Bible Project. And so if you look that up, the Bible Project, you can actually see uh, they have like a a video that's a couple minutes long for each book of the Bible, and it gives you the background. And so you can get the context of what the Bible, that that chapter of the Bible is talking about before you even read it. It's awesome. I highly recommend it. I actually used it before I was preparing this sermon and learned a lot. I learned that John, this is... We assume, we, we believe that this is the John that walked with Jesus, the one that was hanging out with Peter and with James. That he's writing a letter to a bunch of Christian churches. Now, something had happened amongst these two or three Christian churches in which people had decided that they no longer believed that Jesus is God and they no longer believed that Jesus was, had raised from the dead. And so they caused this church split. And it wasn't a church split over silly stuff like the color of the carpet. It was a church split over something serious, theology. And many of these people had left the church and they were trying to get as many people to come with them as they could. And so here's what John says in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, even the people who are causing trouble. Let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, there, there's a lot in that statement. Everybody who loves has been born of God and knows God? You know, what, what about the atheist who who rejects the concept of God, who denies that God even exists, are we saying that they can't love? Because I've personally seen plenty of atheists who are great people, who love their family, who love their wives and their, or, or their husbands and their, and their children and their family. Like I've seen people who don't believe in Jesus at all, who, who love with a deep love for their family and for their friends. But I want to give you a little hint. The kind of love that John is talking about is not the easy love. It's not the kind of love where you, where you just love people who you are related to or who you agree with. This is the kind of love. This is the kind of love for people who you don't agree with, who you don't like, who have different political views than you do. The hard kind of love. Verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And so this is what John was trying to say. Those people who are creating issues, do you see them doing that out of love? Do you see them operating out of love? Because if not, then they can't speak for God because God is love. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent us his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. God sent his very best, precious thing, which was his son. Out of all of the gifts that he could have possibly given us in, in all the universe, The one that was most precious to him was his child. You know, I I can speak on behalf of all the parents in here. 
you know, before you're a parent, you know, there's a lot of things that you value in this life. You know, you may, may value your car or your house or your job. And then you have this little person come into your life. And all of a sudden, all of that stuff takes second fiddle. Right? You value this little person so much that they're the most precious thing to you. And God gave up his son for us. In fact, in verse 10, it says, this is love. Like, you want to know what love looks like? Not that we loved God. That's not the kind of love. That's God loved us first, that he loved us and sent us his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He sent us the most precious thing that he had. He sacrificed the most precious thing he had. Why? Because that's what true love looks like. While we were spitting in his face, while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, and remember when it says that, it doesn't mean God loved us so much. What it means is, is dear friends, since God loved us in this way, that he sent us his son, we also ought to love one another. If this is the example that God sets for us, this is how we should be treating each other. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I love this. This is so deep. No person has ever, with their own two eyes, ever seen God. Like, there's nobody that can say, oh, yeah, I woke up this, this morning and I opened the door and pfft, there was God. Like, nobody can say that. But here's the, here's the truth. This is what, what, what John is saying, is if we could figure out how to love the way God wants us to love, then when people see that, they get a glimpse into who God is. People are desperate to see who God really is. And if we as a community of believers could figure out this love thing, then we would be showing God. Verse 13. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. For those of us who have the Holy Spirit, you guys are, are familiar. He, he is our our stamp that God has given to us to assure us of our salvation, verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. The we in that, that, that passage is John and James and Peter. They're, they're the ones who actually saw Jesus walk on the face of the planet. And so the you in that passage is the believers that, that, that he's writing to, he said, we've seen this and we've told you about it, verse 15. And if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him. And he in God. And he's not talking about saying that you believe in Jesus in church because that's easy. He's talking about acknowledging G that Jesus is the Son of God when it's not easy. When you go home to a, a room full of family members that they think you're crazy because you believe in Jesus. And you stand up and say, no, I believe anyway. Or if you're at work and people make fun of you because you're a church person. And you stand up and say, no, I, I believe in Jesus anyway. Or if, or if you're... You're amongst your peers and your friends, and they make fun of you. Or, you know, I always say the professor. I've got two professors in here. I know you guys don't like embarrass people because they love Jesus, right? But, but there are those of us who have been in college, and we've felt like that before. And here's the truth. Anyone who professes Jesus amongst those when it gets tough, man, those are the ones who truly believe. Verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God lives in him. You see, this love thing is so important. This is what the whole thing is about. And, and sometimes we, we get caught up in the details and we forget that the overall picture, what God is trying... To get to us is love, but not the kind of love that the world talks about. Not the kind of love that, 
that fades out because I don't, I don't agree with you anymore. It's the kind of love that goes past and deeper than, than all that. Verse 17, and in this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. Church, I want to tell you that um, the most horrifying day of any of our existence is going to be the day that we stand before God. I'm going to be honest with you. And, And the reason why it's horrifying is because here's God standing in all of his holiness and perfection. And that holiness is like a light that beams through us and exposes us for our unholiness. Like when we stand in front of the, in front of the one true God, we're going to be like, oh man, that is a horrifying day. But here's the promise of John. If we can figure out this love thing, we have confidence on the day of judgment. Why? Why? Because on the day of judgment, we look around and we go, you know what? Jesus has made such a difference in my heart that I was able to live differently than the rest of the world. I lived, I look a little bit more like God than I do like the rest of the world. So on that day that we can have confidence, verse 18, because there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And because of the love of Jesus Christ, we no longer have to fear the judgment of God. Jesus has paid the price. He has shown the love of God. And now we're challenged to do the same. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. John is talking about those people who have left the church. And and what's happened is a lot of them, they were Jewish. They they said that they professed Jesus. But then after a while, they got nervous. They got scared. Because it's like, no, we got to go back to the law. God's not happy with us, and we have to go back to the law. We have to do all of this stuff, because if not, God's going to get angry with us. Because the truth of the matter is they never really understood the love of God to begin with. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Verse 20, this is really deep. If anyone says, I love God, yet he hates his brother, He's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Think about that for a second. You hate your brother. And so the the obvious question after that is, well, who's my brother? And when I ask that question, I kind of feel like the scribe. Do you remember the scribe that asked Jesus? Jesus said, Uh, You need to love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe said, well, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus told him the parable about the good Samaritan, right? And remember for a Jew, a Samaritan was like the enemy, you know, the, ugh, I hate, hate Samaritans. And he tells this story in which the Samaritan is the man's brother. Wow. And so if we ask the question, who's my brother? Is it my biological brother? siblings is it is it my spiritual siblings is it random people in the park yeah all of the above here's what i want you to think of in the beginning of genesis it says that we are made in his image and so if we hate somebody who was made in the image of god then how can we profess to love God if we hate his image? You, you, you get the, the dichotomy here? I mean, if, if you went and you hated a statue of someone, but then proclaimed to love that person, it's like, wow, I, I, how, how does that work? And so here's what, G, what, what John is trying to say is we need to figure out this love thing because after all, verse 21, this is our key verse, and he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. You know, if you actually read 1 John from the first chapter to the uh, fifth chapter, it's actually a really scary book. 
In fact, uh, if, if you were to read 1 John, you may, like myself, you may start going, oh, man, I don't even know if I'm saved. Because John's like, if you keep on sinning, if you continue to sin the way that you were sinning before, then you're not really saved. And I'm, you know, you read that and you're like, oh my gosh, you know. If you're not obeying the commands of Jesus, then, you know, you're not, you, you know, you're of the world. You're not of Christ. And, and you sit there and you're like, you know, there's something in your pit in your stomach. But then one of the things that I've noticed all throughout the New Testament is whenever it gets really tough and it talks about the commands of Jesus, then it always, just read a few pages later, it always comes to the conclusion. The command that Jesus gave us was to love one another. How are believers supposed to be different? God commands that we be defined by love. And not the cheap kind of love. Not the kind of love where I'm going to love you as long as you are nice to me and as long as I like you and we get along, but then as soon as, as, soon as we don't get along, I'm not going to love you anymore. Right? This is the kind of love that goes, I'm going to love you in spite of yourself. God commands that we be defined by love. You know, it was funny. It was so convicting. I... I I was preparing this, this sermon on a Friday during the day, and then that night, um, I was hanging out with uh, my wife and Raul and Tammy, and we were sitting down having some dinner. And uh, there was some people in the next table over, and this one particular guy was extremely loud, right? I mean, louder than a normal Miamian, and more obnoxious than a normal Miamian. And he was talking bad about everything that I hold dear. Like, it was like, this country is the worst country on the face of the planet. Like, this country is despicable. And he was talking about why this country is despicable. And then, he, then he talked about Miami, how Miami is essentially a, a third world country. And I'm thinking to myself, have you ever even been to a third world country? And then... Then he starts talking about how stupid Christians are. Like, I mean, it, it was just like one thing after another, right? And you feel that, that anger boiling up inside of you, and then all of a sudden, God reminds me of what I'm supposed to be preaching on Sunday. <laughs> We're supposed to be defined by love. You know, as a pastor, listen, I am going to... Every expectation you have of me, I can guarantee you this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fail at some point, right? But I'm hoping that at some point, it may be the day that, you know, I'm, I'm laying in a casket. I, I just hope people would say about me, you know what? He wasn't perfect, but man, he really loved people. In fact, I, I hope that people would say that about you. You know, if you've been... If you said yes to Jesus and you're wondering why your life hasn't changed, let me give you a little tip. If you hate your boss, start praying for your boss. Because here's one of the things I found. Whenever I pray for people on a consistent basis, I have a hard time hating them. If you hate your job, just pray that, that God would help you to, e to either move out of your job or love your job. If you're having a hard time with relationships, pray for that person that you're having a problem with. But at the end of the day, God commands us to be defined by love. And when we do this, the funny thing is, is things start falling into place and we become peaceful people and loving people. For those of us who have been Christians for a long time and you've been involved in Christianity, don't pay attention to what everybody says. Just pay attention to what Scripture says. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of Christians who act like Pharisees. Who they have a bunch of rules that you have to follow. And, and they've, they've gotten so focused on the rules that they forgot the reason why the rules were put there. And that's to love. I want you to think about all the rules, the Ten Commandments. Do we really have to worry about loving, like not being jealous of people if we really love them? I mean, if we really love people, then we don't have to worry about being jealous. We would never be jealous of somebody that we love. We're happy for them. We don't lie to people that we love. 
We don't steal from people that we love. We don't hate people that we love. At the end of the day, God commands that we be defined by love. And finally, for those of us who are here today, if, if you're just wondering about this God thing, and is God going to make me change my life? I, I've got the most wonderful news that I can ever tell you, and I've also got the most horrifying news to ever tell you. So first, the most wonderful news. It's this. God loves you in spite of you. He sent his only son to die for you so that you could become a child of God. But the most horrifying thing is, is if you say yes to Jesus, he's going to ask you to love people unconditionally just like he did for you. Finally, here's, here's a, a final thought for you guys. Go to small group this week. Show love to somebody in your small group. But, but you know, God has called us to make a difference in this world. You know what this world needs more than anything else? Exactly what John was talking about, right? Like we live in a political climate where if you don't believe what I believe, that I hate you. We live in a world that hates, it thrives on hate. There's money to be made in hate. And the world is crying out for the love of Jesus Christ to be displayed in us and through us. Because God commands that we be defined by love. Let me have everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody looking around. If you're here today and you've been thinking about saying yes to Jesus, let me explain to you what saying yes to Jesus even means. It means understanding that God is perfect, that God is holy, but that you and I, we are not perfect and we are not holy. In fact, our imperfection and our unholiness is what the Bible calls sin. And sin separates us from a holy and perfect God. In fact, our sin offends the very nature of who God is. And we are hopelessly separated from God. There's nothing that we can do to fix that. There's no amount of church attendance. There's no amount of charity. There's no amount of money that you can give away to fix the relationship with God. We are hopeless. But if you've missed out on everything else I've said here today, do not miss out on these next few words. But God loves you anyway. You say, but Todd, you don't know what I've done. You're right, I don't. But I know what God the Father did. He sent his only precious child to die for you. That perhaps you have people in this life who love you, but I can guarantee you this. There's nobody in this life who loves you enough to allow their precious child to die for you. That is the unbelievable, unmistakable love of God. The story goes, God sent his son Jesus from heaven to earth. That Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I are not capable of living. But at the end of his life, instead of going back up into heaven, which is what he deserved to do, he laid down his life on a cross. He allowed himself to be executed like a murderer, even though he was innocent. Why? So that no matter who you are today, no matter what you've done, when we say yes to Jesus, we place our sin on him, and he places his righteousness on us. The best part of this story is that when the only child of God places his identity on you, he gives you the right to become a child of God yourself. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, in a moment I'm going to have you raise your hand. And the reason why I asked everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes, because this is private. We're going to just pray and give you an opportunity to say, Jesus, I believe in you. And the reason I want you to raise your hand is just so I know who I'm praying with. And so if you're here today and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, you'd like to become a child of God, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. Amen. Either everybody in here is a believer, or maybe there's some people that are working on that decision, but here's my promise to you. We will do this every week. If you invite somebody who doesn't know Jesus, we will introduce them to Jesus every week here at the Pulse. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would help us to be a people who are defined by love. Lord, not just to love the people who we're comfortable loving, but Lord, challenge us to love the people who we're not comfortable, the people that we don't agree with, 
the people who nobody else in this life loves. Lord, help us to be a people defined by love. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.